They're driving through this Navy yard. He's like, oh, by the way, you know this gang of like six guys you've met? I own this Navy yard and two of the freighters inside it. And a yep. power plant. And a nuclear power plant. Yeah. I also, I bought that, you know, <laughs> diversify the portfolio. They've invested cool. a lot in infrastructure. I mean, fair play to them. I think it's their illegal gang that's also keeping all of the roads maintained. I think they're just the infrastructure of this post-apocalyptic America is the the, the 10 roller boys. <laughs> okay. yeah, it's- so, Marsh, you're saying there are pluses and minuses to a Nazi gang, you know, if they're doing good infrastructure <laughs> stuff. Move. It's important to weigh Some that. people like their rollerblades and we won't take it from them. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back to God Awful Movies, where each week we watch another terrible movie so you don't have to. But this week, you should watch along with us. Go, just pause the podcast. Go watch this movie. It's amazing. And you're back, and we're back. I'm your host, Heath Enright, and sitting to my immediate left is my good friend, Eli Bosnick. Eli, <laughs> how's it going, buddy? Oh, it's going a good awesome. Week? It's such a great week, Keith. Cool. So glad. So glad to be here. Great. It's good. It's a good thing. Uh, it's a good thing my brain works so perfectly. Because otherwise, this week would have been just a constant swarm of hellish information. Just a bombardment of fear and anxiety that no one will ever fix or make better when this is over. But luckily for us, hey. we're all just here to talk about some bad movies. Dude, I Marsh mean- is here to review a very, very Christian movie, everyone. <laughs> Yeah, by the way, we're recording this on Friday the 13th. Yeah, I had a real good 12th reading about stuff. It's a lot of fun. A lot of fun! Fortunately, you guys have self-isolated through career choice rather than through uh, any health decisions, so you were way ahead of things. Uh, I was already doing it the uh, regular way, too. (laughs) And you heard him already, sitting about 4,000 miles to my right in the divided kingdom is my great friend, Michael Marshall. Marsh, welcome back. Thanks, thanks. How are you? I'm yeah, I I am I am delighted to be here. I am having a great week as well. Everything is going super smoothly and uh it the, the best thing is it just seems to get smoother and smoother. That's the weirdest thing. You think this sure. is going really smoothly and then something else is said in the news and you go, "Oh, that's going to make things even smoother." Excellent. <laughs> yeah. But luckily, luckily, you know, you have let me take my mind off world events with this fun distraction of a movie about a society in social and economic meltdown. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's pretty great, though. So let's go ahead and get right into it. Tell us, Marsh, what are we going to be breaking down today? We, I'd say inexplicably, uh, watched Prayer of the Roller Boys. (laughs) It's so apropos. Come on, admit it. This is an amazing choice. (laughs) It's it's the near future story of a dystopian society where a white supremacist drug dealing gang rules the streets via their intimidating synchronized rollerblading display teams. <laughs> amazing. Absolutely they amazing. Do. They're so good at it. They're not good at it. It's the <laughs> best. They are not. And Eli, how amazing was this movie? Well, If you love the Proud Boys, but you're looking for a slightly less homoerotic gang of racists that you can take a bit more seriously, you will love Prayer for the Roller Boys. Prayer for the Roller Boys is the 80s incarnate. It makes no sense. It's weirdly porny. And Mm. it's very against drugs, all while doing a ton of drugs. (laughs) All right. Is there anything you guys would like to nominate this movie? for being the best at being the worst at? I mean, it was it was really hard to like narrow the list down to one thing to say here. I mean, I was going to go for a while with best worth title because I've watched the entire film through and thought about it for the last three days straight and I still can't figure out why, what just the prayer thoughts, no prayers? the Boys is. There's, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's, I just no idea what's going on with the title. What is the prayer <laughs> of the role? Are we praying for them? Is this a prayer by them about something else? Uh, not a clue, not a clue. <laughs> but in the end, I went with uh, best worst hero motivation. Because we've all seen the, the 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 trope in films where you've got the hero and he needs to do something to save his little brother from falling in with the wrong crowd. And this poor, innocent little brother is going to get into, in, involved in all sorts of stuff. So he has to do the thing to try and stop and save this poor... But the innocent brother in this case is just a prick. He's like a 13-year-old <laughs> absolute <laughs> shit in every single scene that I, I want this kid to get everything that's coming to him and more. 
Yeah, it's like if Back to the Future had been about saving Biff. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I also had a very difficult time choosing. I went with best worst bad guy nicknames. Excellent. Excellent choice. <laughs> um, Excellent choice. So, yeah, le- like we said already, it's about an internationally spread out gang that's also into eugenics. They're Nazis and they're drug dealers and they're supposed to be like scary and intimidating. They've chosen rollerblades, which is already way too silly as their theme (laughs) to go with all that stuff. And then they chose their names. So I'll start with the least silly. The leader guy is named Gary Lee, which sounds like, you know, uh, frozen desserts or something. But (laughs) but that's that's just the tip of the iceberg. The other one, two of the other main intimidating bad guys that have to say their name in intimidating, like, bad guy menacey moments are Bullwinkle and Bangle. Do I have that right? (laughs) That is correct, yes. Yeah. Okay. See, I was going to go with best worst apocalypse consistency. So this apocalypse will contain... Fenced in tent city, homeless shelter patrolled by helicopters and gunmen. Yes, it will. Pizza places, mm-hmm. financial firms, yeah. and sex carnivals. It's very <laughs> unclear what's going on in this apocalypse. There, there is a bustling homeless themed sex carnival. There is. Yeah. There's the sex carnival industry. I'll say it took an upswing after whatever this apocalypse it got is big. supposed to be. It got big. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What year is this in the future? What, how, how far in the future, or is this supposed to be like? It's in 1990 as the movie. When's this supposed to be? Do you think? Well, I, I don't know when it is, and I don't know what happened between, like, between the now and the, the the time of the film, because we don't really know what happened, like, what caused this apocalypse, other than like greed. But everything is orange. Everything everywhere <laughs> is orange at all times, and I don't know what that could be. So whenever it is, it's long enough for everything to turn orange. I don't know if like we could probably work that out through like redshift or something. I'm not sure, but um, yeah. it's a Trump shift. It's pathetic. <laughs> all right. Well, we're gonna take a quick break so I can go ahead and grease up my ABEX seven rollerblade bearings, and when we come back, Eli and Marsh are gonna tell you all about prayer of the roller boys. While I do some sweet, sweet backwards crossovers all around the room in my apartment. <laughs> Everyone's doing so their part. So impressive. Thank you. Doing it right now. Marsh could tell. All right, everyone. Welcome to the first ever writer's meeting for Prayer of the Roller Boys 1. Am I right? Ha! Hell yeah. Sequels. Oh, this movie's going to have so many sequels. It will. No doubt. It really will. So, guys, hit me. Okay, okay, okay. What about a uh, post-apocalyptic... Uh, white supremacist. Uh, cult. On, on rollerblades. Uh, they're the sole distributor uh, of a glow-in-the-dark vapor-based drug. Which they're secretly using to sterilize the population. Nice. Right, yeah, yeah. But they can only be stopped by... Uh, a, a prostitution-based undercover cop. Oh, and a hard-nosed detective. Yeah, yeah. And nice. the gang leader's childhood friend. Uh, yeah, played by... Uh, uh, Corey? Mm, one of the Corys. Corey... Mm. Haim. Haim, yes! There we, we go. Did it. That's what this movie's all about. Done. I'm glad we write this through Mad Libs. Right? <laughs> Adverbly. <laughs> Hi, Mr. Enright. I'm Dr. Car- Keith? Keith Enright? Wh- what? Uh, no. Nope. No. <laughs> Come on, uh, silly. Still, um, you remember what? me? Jennifer Carver from high school. Oh. oh my God, I can say this now. I used to have this giant crush on you. You're like <laughs> practically the reason I became a model before I went to Harvard and became a doctor. Oh, cool. Ah, cool, cool, cool. wow. It's good to see you. Anyways, where are my manners? What brings you into the doctors today? Ah, uh, I uh, just... I just want to talk to you about hair loss. Yeah. Want to talk to me, your doctor now about hair loss. Yeah. yeah. Did you try for hims.com? Nope. No, I did not. I came here and waited in your waiting room for 45 minutes. 
kid was hogging the Sports Illustrated. I, did I not have to do that? Is that what you're saying? Oh, no, no, you didn't. You could have gone to forhims.com. What's forhims.com? It's a one stop shop for hair loss, skin care, and sexual wellness for men. Look, you're the doctor. I get that. But seriously? Internet pills? No, you big goof. This is like when I was too nervous to ask you to the prom all over again, so I ended up going with Brad Pitt instead. Forhims.com offers prescription <sighs> solutions backed by science, so you could have skipped this visit altogether. I could have. Oh, yeah. But then I wouldn't have gotten to see you again. Yeah, holding my urine sample while I ask for hair loss medication. Right. Right. So how do I try that for hims thing again? Oh, yeah. Well... If you want to dive into 2020 hair first, right now, our listeners get started with their first month free. Go to forhims.com slash gam. That's F-O-R-H-I-M-S dot com slash gam. Prescription requires an online consultation with the physician who will determine if a prescription is appropriate. Offer valid only if prescribed. Three-month minimum subscription. Additional restrictions apply. See website for full details and important safety information. Remember, that's forhims.com slash gam. Great. Great. Uh, I'm going to go. Uh, I'll take that. I'll take uh, that. You're going to take back your urine sample? Yeah. Yes. This is mine. I, I just, don't want to I, stop it. Okay. I am taking this. No, just no. Just give me. Wait, I'm going. Where I'm are you going? It. Where are you going? Doesn't matter. Goodbye forever. <sighs> Window crash. <laughs> <laughs> and we're back. And we're going to start off this Christian movie with some very Christian symbolism. Yes, are we not? indeed. <laughs> A crucifix being eaten by a goddamn dragon is the first <laughs> shot of this film. And I, I yep. saw that and I thought, I can't believe they've stolen my tattoo idea. I thought I had that <laughs> one locked down. It's so good. So we get the title sequence and then we get cold open on some sweet rollerblading moves. It's the best. Yeah, I wrote my notes here. And you guys laughed at me when I spurned surgical masks and hand sanitizer to hoard rollerblades. Well, who's <laughs> laughing now, huh? <laughs> yeah. And the thing is, from just behind him, rollerblading looks almost cool at this angle. But if you were having like a wide shot of this, it's just a guy going round in a circle at about 10 miles an hour. It would be significantly <laughs> less cool if we saw what this actually looked like. If this movie <laughs> does anything well, and I'm not sure that it does, it does a fantastic job of displaying the limits of rollerblading. <laughs> You're just like, all right, now um, jump and okay, that's it. Yeah, we did it. This this movie must never have any sort of big picture in any figurative or literal sense. It must be zoomed <laughs> all the way in on what it's doing. I reckon. I bet they had loads of really wide angle shots that they filmed, and then they, when they look them like, look back over them, they were like, "We we absolutely cannot put these." Oh, in the because that this is so undermines us. The cutting room floor is filled with that like, is wide so shots. Silly, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and by the way, he's skating through the L.A. River, right? The like the dried out aqueduct of the L.A. River. That's that's where we are. Correct. I'm sure, we're in post apocalypse Los Angeles. So he's skating around, and at some point, he was like. Yeah, all right. So get all my sweet, you know, crossovers and and then he jumps 20 feet into the air <laughs> somehow. And he, he, does he do a flip here? And and he so like he's doing his crossovers and he's like, "Oh, no, this is perfect. Uh get me hitting this trampoline that's also in the middle of this dried out aqueduct." <laughs> he does a flip. It's amazing. Yeah. And we're also watching people apocalypse as he does this undercut. We see the little brother character who we mentioned a little bit in the intro. He's trying to sell a Mr. Coffee he found in the garbage to a wandering street vendor. We see like mountains of trash and armored vehicles. And this is all underscored by Gary Lee, who's going to be our villain, narrating how this apocalypse took place. And, and we talked about this a little bit in the intro, but are we to believe that this took place because adults took out too many credit cards, something, something apocalypse? Well, I mean, <laughs> we're, we're to believe that people borrowed too much money and crashed the economy. <laughs> we are to believe that, Eli. We are to believe that. So here's my question, because we need to get out in front of this now. Gary Lee, this is where we get our first look at him. What do you think he was going for when it comes to physical appearance here? <laughs> he was going for amazing 80s porn. 
So he kind of looks like Flock of Seagulls, uh, the, the lead singer of Flock of Seagulls, yeah. but with a permed version of it. So when when we first heard the, the word Roller Boys, I didn't immediately connect it to rollerblades. I thought that's just how he kept his perm so tight, is that he's just walking around in rollers at all times. Yeah. And so that's what that's what this is. I'd say if I was summing it up real quick, like how, how would he Google him in two words? Uh, Nazi Clydesdale. There you go. Yeah, uh, fantastic. <laughs> yep, well done. So we get our look at him. He's going to be our villain. We've narrated about the apocalypse a little bit. So now we cut over. Um, also, not just the, the 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 apocalypse. There's also like aliens have foreclosed on our nation is something that he said. Right? Yeah, I think he means like al Mexicans. A alien races is what he referred them to in my notes. So, yeah, I think he means uh, not white people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. OK, that makes more sense, because in my head, I was like. All right, so aliens like attacked Earth and they were like, hmm, we got the giant laser beam over the city, but I was thinking housing crisis. Let's try <laughs> housing crisis first. <laughs> Oh God! I, I just I love the idea that you watch this entire film waiting for the aliens to show up. Like, well, I did. Be, we've not got long left. They're they're, they're leaving yeah. it really late to show their faces. <laughs> no, I'd I'd already seen this movie probably in 1990 and a few other times since. So <laughs> I actually knew that wasn't going to happen. But when I heard that, I was like, oh, are there, did I forget about alien races in this? Okay, no. <laughs> there there is a lovely bit where the main guy's uh, he's rollerblading alongside the, the canal there in L.A. And first of all, it occurred to me at this point that the heroes and villains of this film are going to spend all their time on ro rollerblades and I was so happy at that point They just he's just swooshing his way down the street and he looks so happy <laughs> so and so good. sort of elegant in his little swoosh kind of way uh, so that was <laughs> the, the first thing that kind of struck me but then I love the fact he went past some graffiti which uh, said like day <laughs> of the rope but it was in like immaculate handwriting and fair play to that graffiti <laughs> artist. They, re they worked really hard to be accessible because so many graffiti artists don't think of accessibility and making uh, making things legible for people. If they, yeah. but he's, he's, they worked out of the way. I like that. And that's a theme we'll see. Yeah, that's important. Yeah, good point. And it's, yeah, it says the day of the rope is coming in, <laughs> like you said, very neat graffiti. This is a reference we're going to find out to the bad guy's evil plan. <laughs> and it's it's weird to announce that in graffiti all over the city. So like they, they, they were making an evil plan that we will tell you about. And they were like, okay, so phase two, uh, everybody go out and spray paint some vague warnings about our <laughs> all over the city. <laughs> yeah. And by the way, we will only find out what this plot is uh, like 20 minutes before the end of the film. I'm not going to spoil it for you yet. I just want to say that seeing as this was a rollerblade based movie, I was really hoping it was a giant jump rope contest and I wouldn't have been surprised <laughs> if it was. That would have been way more serious. Yeah. So now we're going to cut over to Speedbagger Shop or as I've called it, the last remaining branch of Boy Scouts of America. This is where <laughs> our two main characters live at this point in the movie and they're uh, they're doing some brother stuff. Yeah. And they're watching Gary Lee's like press conference on on nine flat screen televisions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're in a, like an old, we're like an apocalypse pawn shop that has flat screens. And the thing is, they're only looking at one of the screens as well. So I, I feel like you could have turned a lot of those screens off and saved a hell of a lot of electricity at that point. They're not really. <laughs> the Speedbagger, we're going to learn, is not great at uh, the economics of running his business. But also, no. how is Gary Lee doing like an open address to the entire nation? What, how, I, Thank you. What, what happened? I have no idea. Very confused by this. So what channel was like, hey, um, uh, we got to get some more viewers in the apocalypse here. Are there any apocalypse gangs that want to <laughs> read a manifesto during primetime? Because we got a slot for you. Yeah. Ready to go. And Gary Lee was like, yep, yeah, yeppers. <laughs> I'd like you think for a second Fox News would not air that if you sent them a, a tape right. of it. Yeah, no, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. That's a solid point, solid point. And they're um, doing it right now. I just turned on Fox, sorry. Tucker Carlson is talking to Gary Lee right now. I mean, just to be clear, one of Gary Lee's lines is help the white army win back our homeland, which is straight out of Trump's 2020 re campaign uh, re-election slogan. <laughs> oh, it rough. is. It's, it's a lot of parallels. And there's just two characters I want to point out here. This is where we meet Patricia Arquette's character. And she's there to be street harassed by little brother for a second. And then we also meet Speedbagger, who I mentioned at the beginning. This is the magical black gentleman. So again, Christian movie, who has taken the boys under his wing, takes care of them. 
it's unclear yeah. what their relationship to him is. Yeah, he takes care of them with all the money he makes fixing bicycle wheels in the apocalypse. Yep. Which, which is strange. <laughs> Again, very, very confusing post-apocalyptic economy going on in this particular yeah. episode of God Awful Movies. So it's, it's not just bicycle wheels, though, because also Patricia Raquette walks in at this point and, and has her rollerblading wheels and he starts fixing those as well. So he, he's just a, an all-round wheel guy. He's, he's a wheel guy. To wheel okay, guy. he's yeah. like your bearings guy. Yeah, okay. Yeah. That, that if makes it's, more if sense. it's circular, he's down. Yeah. Yeah, I got it, got it. And and uh, yeah, she comes in and this is where um, we get to meet the first little moment for Milty is his name, right? Mm-hmm. Is that the kid? I mean, it's, it's either Milty or Milfy or Melty. It's it's really hard to hear at any <laughs> given point. I agree. I thought it was Milky for like half the movie. <laughs> I think it's Milt, like Milton, but Milty mm. for short, maybe. But Corey Haim, who is the main character, he is Milty's older brother. He can't say it, and he says it different every time. So <laughs> yes. it's not your fault if you got this wrong. <laughs> but uh, this is where Milty sees Patricia Arquette come in, and he is eleven. Maybe, right? Yeah. And he starts just shamelessly, aggressively flirting with her on behalf of his older brother, Corey Haim. And mm -hmm. he's like, my boy right here, Griffin is his name. He's the best rollerblader in town. You want to fuck? <laughs> so uh, kind of upsetting. Also, pro tip, uh, that does not work. It does not. You, <laughs> no, that approach the, does not work. The rollerblading base pickup lines. No. So <laughs> now we cut over to... The Griffin character, the main character, our protagonist, on his way to work, or as I call it, we cut over to what I picture when I think of Martian Andy planning QED, a.k.a. <laughs> two candy stripers <laughs> with machine guns climbing into a VW bug. <laughs> <laughs> Which, to be fair, is going to be QED 2020 if the coronavirus doesn't quit it. That is going to be what is happening <sighs> later this year. So again, just to be clear, this is a post-apocalypse where pizza delivery still exists. And we're about to learn pizza delivery to like tent cities fenced in and guarded by armed guards still exists. But it's necessary that the pizza delivery vehicle be a armored VW bug <laughs> and the employees carry <laughs> machine guns. Yep. And I'm pretty sure that Neil Stevenson based most of Snow Crash on this amazing movie. I like oh, a lot for of sure. It. So yeah, they're going to deliver some pizzas. Uh, we actually see the municipal homeless shelter here in this scene. Everyone has their own barrel of fire, like some kind of <laughs> fancy <laughs> Amazon do. employee of the month. It's pretty cool. Yep. FEMA provides plenty of fire barrels. Uh, maybe focus on viral testing kits or something like that. I don't know. Just <laughs> other things for FEMA to think about. It'd be great. I also want to point out that this is where we see our first scene of people uh, doing mist. Or as I put it in my notes, meanwhile, an old guy is huffing a glow stick? <laughs> <laughs> that is what it looks like. Yeah. <laughs> it's so silly. It's like this giant, silly contraption. Do you ever go to one of those, like, uh, oxygen bars. It, they have them in like Vegas casinos where they, they like, they give you like a Red Bull and vodka and they give you the little oxygen tube up your nose and somebody gives you a shoulder massage and it's supposed to like pep you up to spend more money at their stupid casino. <laughs> it's like that all lit up. Yeah. This movie invented vaping too, by the way. It, yep, it's, exactly. Uh, yeah, exactly. That's time. true. Fat plumes. Visionary. <laughs> All right, so now the brothers are wandering around trying to find their next delivery. And uh, they're tapping the Jeep. They have like this giant television in the middle of their console that's supposed to be what a GPS is going to be. And it's really, really fantastic. <laughs> yeah, it's great because uh, Misty says, this GPS doesn't work. And I, and I wrote him a note. Yeah, that's what happens when your map is on a VHS. It's, it's not going to be all that interactive, to be honest, guys. You're gonna Hold struggle. on, rewind the map. Rewind the map. We're in the wrong place. But... As they're driving around, they pass a burning house. So, you know, L.A. hasn't changed that much, which is nice. <laughs> the point is, no. Griffin crashes his van, his pizza delivery van, into the house and frees the young drug dealer who was inside. Right? Yeah, the guy is, like, yelling, like, oh, I'm, uh, I'm going to be on fire in a second. He's two steps away from his front door, yelling <laughs> through a window to Griffin. And Griffin's like, D just walk slightly. To, to your left, man. I, <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't know why I needed to stop. All right, if you're not going to walk to the door, uh, it feels like it won't help to smash it in with my van, but, you know, smash. So he smashes <laughs> it in, and then he, he saves. What we learn in a minute is 
Bullwinkle. He's a drug dealer. He's a roller boy. And he's a roller boy. Exactly. And, and I love that Pinky, his, uh, his, his pizza delivery kind of boss, shows up and is really upset about his van. But clearly the script just had Pinky is upset about his van and the actor had to kind of vamp and carry on ad-libbing. And the actor really runs out of different ways to express how upset he is about his van. He just kind of <laughs> really peters out into sort of, oh, my van. Oh, van. Because crash. Pizza man, guys. Anyone want to come in with another line? No. It's, okay. It's your line. Upset about my van. <laughs> How did I get here in three seconds from that crash? Ah. Uh... <laughs> the VHS GPS is how I did it. Yeah. So, yeah. so he rollerblades away after having been fired. He's all sad and disappointed. And who should he run into but the roller boys? And this is the first time we see how the roller boys travel. And they rollerblade <laughs> in a perfect V with arm swinging unison. It is the funniest thing anyone has ever seen. <laughs> oh, it's, it's absolutely incredible. And every so single excited. moment of this, it makes me laugh. It constantly made me laugh. Like there's a bit where the roller boy leader like approaches Griffin. And when he does, he rolls towards him and then ends it with a little spin. And I genuinely spurted out a laugh at that point. I <laughs> oh. just could not contain myself. That's the like ro roller hockey spin stop that you're supposed to be able to do if you can't you can either do the heel break but they don't have that like they have these but you don't have those on like roller hockey skates so this is like the spin move one and he's not at all good at doing it and it's <laughs> so delightful he like spins and then like takes that those like extra two seconds at the end to get his balance and like compose himself <laughs> oh it's, yeah it's a sort of delicate pirouette into an intimidatory <laughs> stare it's a remarkable combination but yeah this is Gary Lee and it turns out that he and Griffin used to be childhood friends and lived yeah. near each other. So, Which is a fact that is widely known, it turns out, in this universe. <laughs> it's yeah. a very, very common piece of knowledge that, we, that everybody seems to have. And I don't yeah. know if this was just Gary Lee's acting or what it was about this particular scene, but Gary Lee's entire performance here is just like, hey, thank you very much. I don't know how to say stuff in a non-threatening manner, but I'm actually very <laughs> grateful. <laughs> <laughs> And it's yep. great because he, he makes Bullwinkle uh, say thank you to Griffin for having rescued him from the burning house. And Bullwinkle sort of like comes forward and says thank you. But it's in a very kind of like Bullwinkle's eight no. and the leader's his mum. It's like, what do you say, Bullwinkle? Thank you. <laughs> say it properly. Thank you for rescuing me from the burning house. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And all these roller boys are lined up, fanned out, trying to be intimidating here. And just this, every time this happened in the movie, and it happens constantly, I wanted it so bad for somebody on that big, intimidating, fanned out line to lose their balance and do that violent fall thing <laughs> during the big speech that Carrie <laughs> Lee's doing. Where you like, you like, you you know, one foot kind of comes out and you do that violent spin to the ground thing. It, yes. It's so loud and awkward. I wanted, yep. Oh my God. Would have been great. For the rest of the movie, I couldn't think about anything else. The one thing that struck me as they all sort of skate away again in unison, and for one thing, you know, they're all dressed identically in order to be intimidating, but it comes across as like the cast of Starlight Express trying to do a Clockwork Orange. It's got that kind of vibe <laughs> going on. It's not remotely intimidating. But as they skate away and Milty's looking at them like, wow, cool. We see that Milty's on a skateboard, which is objectively a million times cooler than rollerblading. <laughs> Ooh. Controversial words. All right. <laughs> I am so conflicted right now. I don't know whether I to yell at my old self or my new self. <laughs> You've broken Heath. Clean I in do. half. I so like both. <laughs> well, just really quick, can we discuss one more thing about the roller boys? I wish um, you would. The enormous coats. Yes. <laughs> the enormous coats. It's a rollerblading themed gang. They constantly are trying to like quickly navigate through cities, apocalypse, the sharp things coming out. I needed more coats getting caught on stuff and like <laughs> wind resistance being a problem and them like being blown sideways oh, and falling more. It flapping up into their faces and them getting exactly. tangled Thank in it mid-roll. Yeah, that would have been good. <laughs> oh, 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 dude. Especially because they roll up oh really close together. So the guy in front of you, his coat's going to be all up in your face constantly. <laughs> yeah. I just want to see like squabbles of them like, God, put your, put your coat down. Come on, I can't see a thing here, man. Gary, Jesus. Take the belt out. We did. We said take the belt out. I got hit in the face again. <laughs> Almost got my eye. All right. So <laughs> later that night, we cut over to our main character heading into the Roller Boys hideout. Okay, I'm confused. Here's what it is. It's a carousel. 
with machine guns and champagne and very, very, very many balloons and um, ladies with no shirts on. Also, uh, and a mermaid. There's a mermaid. A, there is a mermaid and jello wrestling or oil wrestling. Yeah, it's, it's a fancy dress arms fair. This <laughs> is your, ba your basic gangster carousel mermaid party. Mermaid and costume I, I party. Swear, I paused it at one point. I swear there was someone dressed as a furry pink six foot tall cock and balls. I swear <laughs> it was there. I saw it. I paused it. I looked at it for a while. It's definitely there. Look, it's on YouTube. People can check Keep that information. It. <laughs> it's on YouTube. People can check it out for themselves. <laughs> and one other detail I want to touch on about this roller boy party. There's a picture cake, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> of a roller boy with the caption, like, roller boys forever, day of the rope. And I just really, really wanted to be there for them ordering that. Hey, welcome to Karen's Cakes. Can I help you? Hi. Yes, uh, I'm ordering a cake for a birthday. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Uh, and I was hoping we could do, uh, like, a picture cake. Oh, know, sure. Sure. The, yeah, we do those. Yep. Now, did you want to get that printed on a cake? Or were you thinking more of, like, a frosting decoration situation? Oh, yeah. Frosting decoration. Great. Mm. Great, great, great. Any message you want on there? Yeah. Um, I wanted to say, Roller Boys Forever, mm -hmm. uh, Day of the Rope. Day of the Rope. Of the rope. Got rope, it. Yeah. And can I ask what organization this is for? It's a um it's a white supremacist roller gang. Oh, lovely. My nephew's in one of those. Just wanted to make sure you weren't gay. Oh yeah, for sure. Not. We uh, nope, we uh we fuck women. Um do you take wads of sweaty money? Yes, we do. Great. There's an amazing bit where <laughs> a kid, it, uh, is this meant to be Gary Lee's birthday or something like that? Because a kid gives him is. a present and the present is a voucher for a year's worth of mini golf. That is correct. And I thought, yeah, but to be fair, a voucher for a year's worth of mini golf is is like one game of mini golf. May, maybe even less than that. Maybe even what? less. How much, you don't play a lot of, how much mini golf do you guys play? I think you can play a, <laughs> you can play a game and go like, well, that, I, I've done that now. I've, I've knocked it through the windmill. I think that's me good for the next year. <laughs> <laughs> also, Tick. yeah, like it. this is a post apocalypse where not just mini golf exists, but mini golf gift certificates <laughs> exist. Like that's a weird <laughs> right. mini golf economy has made it through the apocalypse. And and this <laughs> child apparently owns a mini golf course and has like the power to give away <laughs> year long subscriptions to it. Or I guess. purchase I don't know. one. It's very unclear. Yeah. But, th but then we get to see more carousel playing and I it's they're all on rollerblades as usual so they're like rollerblading around the carousel and then they're it's bad guys they're it's supposed to be intimidating <laughs> criminals yeah and they're on a carousel being like fucking fuck society we're a gang wee, wee. <laughs> i was gonna say <laughs> like the roller boys definitely say we more than any other dangerous gang in cinema i think it's fair to say that <laughs> i also i, I just want to if i may stand on a soapbox for a moment, not related to the movie, but there is oil slash jello wrestling. And I just want to say, I don't understand the appeal of oil or jello wrestling. Like, I don't want to watch attractive people fight each other. Why is that? Let's like, they all gather around and cover people in jelly while they have a big fight over how much rent they can pay. I don't understand it. And, and the appeal what? seems to be that like, oh, well, if they, if they have a big fight, we can all pretend that it's nice touching, but nice touching is a thing. You can yeah. cover people in oil and they can nice touch each other. That that would be great. And in fact, it's it's two, uh, you know, women in bikinis in the, the jello wrestling and <laughs> one girl ends up taking it way too seriously <laughs> and goes so far over the top, starts like smashing the other one's face into the ground over and over and over. And everybody's like, oh, Okay, uh, hey, hey, Not really hey, the hey, point of hey, chili. Uh, did you hear what Eli said about the gentle touching? Maybe you'll... <laughs> maybe you'll yeah, we, we found female Heath in the uh, in the wrestling pool. <laughs> it's way too competitive. <laughs> I'm winning jello wrestling. I, okay, you, you win then. Everybody... It's, and then it's, the, it's the lady it's Heath of foil wrestling, and we found her here in <laughs> prayer of the roller boys. So... Two important things happen in this scene. The first is Gary Lee offers Griffin to be in the Roller Boys again, and he says no again. And Griffin takes Patricia Arquette's underwear is the only way I can describe what happens after that. Walk us through what happens there. 
Yeah. So, I mean, first of all, we have her talking to Bangle and the dialogue is incredible because uh, he says to her, uh, you know, you don't need to be in a bikini in the juicy. I won't tell your daddy. And Patricia Arquette says, that's not my daddy. It's the Loch Ness Monster I'm worried about. And I wrote, oh, I've developed aphasia. Words no longer mean anything to me. That's what's happened here. This is the only explanation. And right. And then then they they kind of walk outside of the party, uh, Patricia Arquette and Corey Haim. And she's pretending to be an undercover cop. She she is an undercover cop and she's pretending to be uh, a mist buyer here. Is that what's happening? Yes. Yeah. And she's dressed as like a sexy pirate. Naturally. The big reveal of her character, as Heath just said, is that she's an undercover cop. So part of her plan as an undercover cop is to try and buy drugs from him again, but this time to have sex with him for yep. those drugs? Or at the very least, swap her underwear for some drugs. Maybe that's what she thought was happening, like a transaction here. Yeah. Oh, that's cheaper than I was expecting. But again... He like takes off her underwear very like slowly and sexily and then he hands it to her and he's like, ha, ah, no thanks. <laughs> it's just a very weird moment that happens in the movie that I needed to confirm wasn't me just like falling asleep halfway through my oh, watch. It's, no, it's crazy it's, it's, in it's the moment. It's a bit upsetting, yeah. But as we teased earlier, now it's time for him to head over to the sex carnival. And I just want to be clear, when I say that he heads over to the sex carnival, I mean that there is a... <laughs> literal circus tent which he enters and there is a barker in the background of this scene being like hurry 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 two yep. for the price of one yeah it's loveland usa apparently I, I listened to what the barker was saying and he's gone welcome to loveland usa everybody that's uh it's an, an unusual choice for a brothel to have a barker typically they're more low-key than that i'd imagine but uh fair play for booking the trend here yeah, really wanted the well-spoken Japanese guy who scared me and Heath away from Japan's red light district to show up and calmly offer Corey Haim a prostitute here. I would have been a lot more comfortable. <laughs> but what is Griffin's motivation here? Because he went to that party to try and rescue his little brother from the Roller Boys. And when his little brother wouldn't come with him, he goes, fuck it, I'll go to a sex carnival then. Like, I don't understand what the, the process in his brain was. Why is he going to this brothel circus? Yeah, it's very, I think he's literally just like, well, now Patricia Arquette got me all worked up. I got to go get rid of this boner at this sex carnival. <laughs> <laughs> but luckily, before we watch him, you know, patronize the sex carnival, two cops from a Dick Tracy comic book jump out and decide to attack him, arrest him. It's unclear. They're later going to be identified as cops, but they just look like Dick Tracy villains and they jump out at him. Yeah, it's it's entirely inexplicable. And I, I do like that he gets away from these two two cops with their guns out by just like pushing them and then rollerblading away. And it's like, sweet, <laughs> yeah, that'll work. That absolutely nailed it, mate. Yeah, I mean, he makes it away temporarily because he turns a corner and then boom, he gets caught by who I have called McGruff the crime dog. This is going to be like the, the head of police uh, who will grab him. And so now we're going to cut over to the police station where McGruff is going to try to get him to join the Roller Boys to turn them in. And what we do learn in, in just a little bit, a nice little touch of world building is that when the apocalypse happened, it took away all of the filing cabinets in the world. So now police have to <laughs> store their files in just piece of paper in piles in the middle of the corridor as you're dragging, uh, dragging your villains in. It's, uh, it's a nice little touch for world building. Yeah, we will sure. see later in the movie that the... Roller boys hoarded all the file cabinets very strategically. <laughs> that, that is true. <laughs> they did. Because we, we learn all the things that the roller boys own because the cop kind of tells us this. So they own like all this property. They own factories, buildings, um, roller blades, um, some, some spare laces <laughs> just in case the ones they've got snap. They, they really Foreign are getting everything investments. together. investments. Yeah. I needed to see these transactions as a scene. Like the, the roller boys purchasing foreign investments and doing all these things. None of that. They don't show us any of that. It's yeah, amazing. it's it's very sad. We, we, we want all of those scenes. But yeah, for some reason, he also knows that he was next door neighbors with Gary Lee, the white supremacist gang leader when he was eight years old. I, I think this is on Gary Lee's Wikipedia page. That's the only explanation <laughs> for it. Is that everyone Googles Gary Lee. And comes up. Fun fact, he was uh, next door neighbors of uh, Griffin, the, the pizza guy. <laughs> So yeah, he says uh, he's not sure if he can join the the Roller Boys because he was out of that. He's out and he doesn't want to have anything to do with them. And then this is where we get the reveal of Patricia Arquette being an undercover cop. We, we cut to her and McGruff 
watching the video of the conversation we were just watching. And he's like, what do you think? You think he's the one? And she's just like, no. <laughs> but I, I love the fact that she's still in fancy dress at this point, which which, <laughs> if you're a bad filmmaker, you say, oh, makes sense because we've just seen her. But we, it can't have been just having seen her because that interrogation happened. They filmed it. They then took that cassette of the, the interrogation to her so that a time has passed and she still sat there in sexy pirate uniform, presumably with a knicker still in her hand. I have no idea. Like, why is she not changed? Why doesn't this all hold together? It's It's incredible. All right. Well... It looks like Roller Boys LLC International is a perfectly legitimate multinational corporation during the apocalypse run by like 10 teenagers. Or is it? It is. But more <laughs> stuff happens. So stay tuned and we'll be right back. Hey, Kelly, could you cancel all my meetings till my meeting with a new client is over? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Great. And now you can send them right in. Yeah. Ah, yes. Uh, Mr. Lee and uh, Mr... Bullwinkle. Right. Well, before we begin, uh, I want to thank you on behalf of Chester and Havisham for investing uh, with us. Our firm's been handling major investors like yours for over a century, and uh, you guys can... Uh, uh, sorry, sorry. Um, uh, where can I put my super dope overcoat? Oh, um, the, the peg on the wall behind you? That, that, that's, that's fine. I'm going to put my coat there too. Great. Great. I mean, if you got, if you gentlemen all want to take off your uh, rollerblades as well, that'd be uh, never uh, roller boys forever. Roller boys forever. Day of the rope. Day, day of the, the rope. rope. Day, day of the rope. rope. Right. Yep. Yeah. Day. Day. Day, day of the rope. Yeah. Day of the rope. Indeed. Yeah. Absolutely. So, uh, about your portfolio, have you got any particular things Sorry, in mind? Hate to interrupt you again. Can I hang my machine gun up on the same peg as my coat, or do you have a separate machine gun? Please, please do. On the peg is it's fine. It's fine. Cool. Uh, I'm gonna do the same thing. Um. Great. A roller boys forever. Yep. Day of the rope. Day of the rope. Yep. Day of the, day of the rope. Day of the yep. rope. Yep. yep. Um, so did you, did you guys have any particular... Sorry. Sorry. Uh, just one second. Uh, this, is, I'm, this, is, this is my comic book guy on the phone. I got to take this. <sighs> Your comic just book guy? Yeah. Yeah. We distribute comic books for our white supremacist gang is sort of a uh, public service. Oh, um, okay. I see. This isn't too weird, this meeting, right? Oh, no, not at all. I was the uh, finance manager for a bunch of rappers in the year 2020. Wow, that must have been wild. Oh, yeah, it sure was. Yeah, day of the rope. Day, day of the rope, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, listen, Lucky the Leprechaun, just give me the pot of gold and I'll free you fair and square. Oh, never no illusions. You'll never get me jewelry. Uh, offensive, seriously? Heath, get out of the ad for me jewelry. You're, You're not in the ad you, for me you jewelry. You get out of the ad for me jewelry. You're not in it. Sorry about that. You'll never get me jewelry. Wait, 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 did you say me jewelry or me jury? Uh, the first one. Why? What's me jewelry? Uh, me jewelry makes fine jewelry for every day. Without the 10 time markups, it's fairly priced, handcrafted, ethically sourced, and made to last. It is? Yeah. Plus, you get free shipping on all U.S. plus Canadian orders until April 20th, plus easy returns and a two-year warranty. Ah, but who must you capture for that? I must know! You don't... N nobody. You just you just go to Majuri.com slash awful or use code awful at checkout for 10% off your first order. That's M-E-J-U-R-I dot com slash awful for 10% off your first order. In fact, you can keep your lousy pot of gold. I'm going to go order something from them instead. Huzzah! Oh, Majuri has saved Majuri. What? They sound similar. Mm -hmm. No, I get it. And we're back. When we left off, Corey Haim had agreed to become the Donnie Brasco of the roller mafia. And <laughs> now he's standing out on Santa Monica Pier by himself, just like slow playing it, letting the mob come to him. <laughs> <laughs> also, I just want to throw out there, we see some more Roller Boy graffiti here, which I know Marsh mentioned earlier in the show. Uh, this graffiti is what I would call mm, on the nose, a bit on the nose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they specialize in very literal graffiti, very, very specific <laughs> literal graffiti. Just no nuance, no subtext. Get it all Inline out. Inline skates and eugenics. Yay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. You know, you know what I appreciate is that the roller boys at least have direct messaging. Be honest. <laughs> Just be honest. You're into those two things. Got it. 
Oh. Little flash cut to everyone like having that fight with their shitty uncle who's like, I'm sorry, I like the roller boys because they speak their minds. They don't fuck around. <laughs> <laughs> you heard about the non roller boys emails? <laughs> <laughs> There's an incredible moment. Again, one of the moments in the film that made me laugh out loud is he's standing around just kind of contemplating joining the roller boys. And a roller boy, a random roller boy, just rolls up, skates right up to him and says, <laughs> so when are you joining the roller boys? And then immediately <laughs> skates off screen. And then we cut to a widescreen and he's disappeared. He's not even there. Is, is this his mind? What happened? Corey Hames just like, oh, you, you, you skated all the way over here to ask that? And then you just get away. Okay, you're gone. He's gone. Uh, cool. And then, it, then it's suddenly nighttime as well. So that was the entire scene we saw outside during the day for that five second scene of random stranger asking him if he's joining up. Oh, amazing. Yeah. By the way, that guy, that roller boy had an AK-47 just like strapped over his shoulder <laughs> as he's skating around. <laughs> so it's like, is this open carry on AK-47s? That's ridiculous. Okay, no, sorry. No, never mind. Never mind. <laughs> not everything. Yeah, I was going to say, it's nice that not everything has changed. <laughs> So now we're going to see Minty doing some misdealing here. Milty? Minty? Yeah. Minty, whatever Milty, is. whatever his name is. <laughs> yeah. He does a little bit of uh, misdealing. And right in the middle of his drug deal, the other gang, I call them the Jean Vest gang throughout the entirety of the, the movie. The Sharks from West Side Story. The B-13s <laughs> yeah. is what B -13s, they're called, the B-13s. They're going to do a drive-by shooting of the Roller Boys. Yeah, yeah. And Roll I, I by do shooting love as well. You that, uh, I love that uh, Milty was selling mist for the low, low price of a random handful of bills. Because the guy who sells it to you just grabs a random, like, there you go. Is this enough? Yeah, sure. That's, that's, that's about yeah, right. Yeah, that bill's like a handful. You think I wouldn't count that fucking handful? <laughs> <laughs> so we get, we get a tense shootout here. And by the way, if you're wondering what the only thing sillier than a gang on rollerblades is, it's a gang in a firefight on rollerblades. <laughs> because they all have to do like they all have to walk inside this building where they're being shot at. And so we watch them do that chunky rollerblade walk that people have. Like, Tong, duh, ow, ankles, ow, ow. <laughs> And the thing is as well, so Griffin says to Misty, he said, well, you know, the Roller Boys, they're all racists. And I thought, it's strange how it's not really come up that much in this film. They mentioned white supremacy early on, but we've not seen any evidence of that. And then when the gang roll up and start shooting, it's just a car filled with all of the other racers taking shit turns <laughs> one by one of shooting. It's like, oh, okay, I, I get it now. I get it now, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then they chase Corey Haim through the city for a second, and then he mm. runs into a fence that he can't hop over, and they corner him. Yeah, and this movie doesn't realize that trucks can drive faster than people can run because we keep turning a corner <laughs> and Corey Hayden has managed to get an extra distance between him and the truck. Well, he's quite the rollerblader, <laughs> but they eventually catch him. But right when he's about to get shot by the MS-13 or B-13, whatever, the bad guy <laughs> gang, then Bullwinkle shows up and saves him at the last second. Yeah, and, and not... Not until he, like, does a weird Dwight Schrute-esque monologue about his karate skills. <laughs> it's the best. It's fun. He it's shoots the, the bad guys and he's like, let me tell you something about wrist control. <laughs> Hidden the shadows like a ninja because I'm a ninja. That's right. You're welcome for the murder. And uh, now we're, I take back my grumbly thank you from before. Now we're square. <laughs> now we're and square. Then then our, our sort of hero's motivation, which is Milty, the little kid, starts kicking the dead body. And like, this, <laughs> protecting does. this boy is going to be the reason we care about our, our lead character's motivation. And here he is giving, like, absolutely kicking the shit out of a dead corpse right now. Yeah. With his rat tail that got exponentially larger since the scene before. It, <laughs> it gets does. Ridiculous. It, gets, it gets larger in every scene of the movie. So now we're going to cut to the next day where he's reporting for roller boy duty at his... Lovely postmodern home. The Again, best, this is very strange. Oh, the this best is, headquarters ever. <laughs> there's so much going on in this house. One of one of the things that caught my eye while they're having this scene is in the background, you've got a full suit of armor with a cape and a fluorescent light bulb as a sword and then a fluorescent halo on the suit of armor. Oh, did that catch your eye? <laughs> yeah, that caught yeah. Your eye? <laughs> somehow stood out. Yeah, yeah. That took up the entire frame. <laughs> they also have a series of what I'm going to go ahead and call sexy mannequin television holders. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and, and you've got Bullwinkle who sat indoors on patio furniture reading the newspaper and the front page of the newspaper, again, world building, scene setting, the front page of the newspaper, the headline, Germany buys Poland. 
And you think, <laughs> what, what picture did the uh, picture editor of the paper use to illustrate that? I'm guessing a map of Germany, a map of Poland. That's the best way to illustrate that story. <laughs> mm-hmm. so, right. So, yeah, this is Corey Haim Griffin shows up at the headquarters and he's like, yeah, I got a three o'clock about becoming a rollerblade Nazi. Can I uh, get in to talk with Gary Lee? <laughs> Gary Lee's in the, in the middle of buying guns. And th- that conversation is basically, hi, yeah, I'd like to buy some more guns, please. And thank you. Yeah, thanks very much. Could you give me more guns? You no, will, but yeah, not until you finish the guns you've got on your plate. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> the- <laughs> that's the actual line, though. He like what he's he's walking up the stairs of their weird little HQ with like a fancy Japanese businessman, and the actual line is, "I'd really like to buy more guns." And the guy's <laughs> like, "We'll see, we'll see." I have to talk to my boss about selling you more of the thing that we sell, but uh, maybe. <laughs> and then and then they <laughs> they hand the Japanese guy a giant like Chewbacca ammo belt of cash. Yes, very weird monetary system, which he does not count, by the way. He just looks at it and he's like, yep, one belt of money. That's how much guns cost. (laughs) It's a standard unit of currency at this point. (laughs) (laughs) All right, you get one belt of guns for that. Perfect. Yeah. There's a lovely line about the gun that they've got in their hands as well. Uh, he says, uh, that gun was only used for that week that the Israelis were used to mop up Northern Ireland. Again, more world building. Brilliant. Lightning <laughs> round. <laughs> what, a, what a cohesive universal view we have of global politics at this point. Amazing. Yeah. Never going to clean up Belfast without some Jews and some <laughs> guns, right? <laughs> great. Great. Yeah, it's good writing, shitty uncle. Thanks. Yep. <laughs> and they used it. <laughs> This is also where he has the like, okay, I'm in conversation with Gary Lee. And Gary Lee and him has this amazing conversation. He's like, yeah, you're going to love it, man. It's going to be just like when we were kids, when we were blood brothers. Also, apropos of nothing, I hate traitors. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, One more thing, apropos of nothing. I have a dinosaur that I am now petting, and it's ridiculous. (laughs) The iguana. This actor hates this iguana. Right. It's very clear. He was like, and then you go over and sinisterly pet the iguana. And he's just like, you ever have a friend who has a shitty cat, but doesn't know it. And so they're like, come on over and say hi to Mittens. And Mittens like has a fucking hunting knife that he's slowly drawing across his tongue. So you got to do one of those like sideways, like, hi, Mittens, please don't out, out, out. So that's what he's doing with this iguana. Don't do this in front of company. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, they both hate each other. Gary Lee hates this. You you say iguana. It's a fucking T-Rex. It's absurd. <laughs> Again, the entire frame is taken up by this dinosaur that he's just like barely acknowledging throughout the scene. And then finally he's like stroking it like the evil guy with the cat. Yeah, and then you have the super spy moment for, for Griffin here who's very clearly recognizes he's there. He's on the clock. So he's like, yeah, 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 Blood Brothers. By the way, what's the uh, day they're up? Just straight out yes, there. Yes, it's the just uh, is- say, say it into my chest, you know. For fun. <laughs> you know how sometimes we talk into each other's chest, just like, <laughs> cause, cause, you know, just, you know, because we're close. <laughs> so now it's time to head over to the shipyard for his initiation into the roller boys. And so here's the initiation. He has to roller blade. <laughs> this, is, this is the greatest. I love this scene so much. <laughs> now, I'm, is... I don't know if we are to believe that this is the initiation for everyone, <laughs> but it's definitely it is. his initiation. He has to um, rollerblade race three other roller boy hopefuls. Initiates, yeah. Across an, a well-armed and well-guarded shipyard and steal a security badge. Yeah, and Gary Lee specifically says as well, be creative with it. Which yep. I hope they were scoring at an artistic merit like the Olympics, just holding little placards up at the end. <laughs> oh yeah, that's a, that's a solid 8.9. <laughs> Russian judge keeps giving him a two. This is what, <laughs> ah. <laughs> so we get to watch that. We watch a rollerblade race to the death. <laughs> yep. And so they, they get released off the back of this truck, like into the shipyard compound, ready, set, go. So the four initiates start going. The shipyard compound is, they're protecting important stuff. They have guards with automatic weapons and they just start firing right away. One guy gets killed. One of the four initiates. I thought all, immediately. Like, I wanted, <laughs> immediately. I wanted all of them to just get shot right away. Like would <laughs> actually happen. And then Gary Lee just being like, all right, that, uh, all right. This is not no, a great system. We, we, no this new is why we only have week. 10 people in our entire multinational <laughs> corporation. I just want to point out one thing that occurred to me during this. 
I do not know why I wasted my life thinking of jokes and characters and observations when the funniest thing in the universe is a rollerblade race. Because <laughs> here's the thing that you realize watching this rollerblade race. You can only go so fucking fast on rollerblades. So they have to do this like, yeah, 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 pushy offy thing in order to race. But they're like a foot from each other and they can't touch each other because they'll fall down because that's how fucking rollerblades work. It's the fucking peak of comedy. Literally, I just watched the whole thing being like, I have no jokes that are funnier than what I am watching right now. The whole time, all I wanted... They're going all through this shipyard, like little like alleyways between cargo containers and ducking under stuff and getting away from trucks again that are uh, slightly slower than rollerblading. And <laughs> all I wanted was just a big, long grass area. And they have to just like, <laughs> all right, walk it, walk it, walk it. It's ah, oh, the wheels are going to get wet. It's going to be wet. They're going to be slippery when I get off. And then they get off and they kind of <laughs> can't push <laughs> off for a little bit. Do you think at any point in the making of this film, the filmmakers thought, "Oh shit, we we shouldn't have gone with rollerblade, and it's really really dumb actually." Now now that we but we, we're, we're invent, we've already spent some of the budget on buying everyone roller skates. We, we're committed to this now, but this is committed. This is going to be rough. We bought a bunch of sets of rollerblades. We bought two giant trench coats that only make sense with a rollerblading gang. So that's that's locked in with the Z Cavaricis and the suspenders. What's that about too? The crazy. <laughs> The pants and the suspenders and the the black t-shirts, the whole thing. The the roller boy outfit is my fucking favorite. Oh, and I just want halfway through the 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 filming of this, just one of the crew to go, motorbike gang. That's what it should <laughs> motorbike gang. That's cool. That's a motorbike gang. That's what oh, I meant. Oh, damn. I wanted the like square formation roller skate gang to show up at some point and there to be like a rivalry <laughs> there, like a roller derby situation versus Ooh. inline. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. So yeah, Corey wins. Griffin wins the big race and Gary Lee shoots the other guy who came in second, which again felt like a weird choice, right? Like they were like, how many gang members this week? Well, still one because we kill everyone who doesn't. Oh, all right. Feels like a hard, hard to expand. We're slowing our growth. You don't want to over hire. You got you to stay within our means, you know. There's a bit where, Cor where Corey Hain ends up in the back of the van with uh, Gary Lee and he says, where did you get the guns? It's like, you were there for that conversation. You heard them get the guns. You had one of their guns. You shot the telly with one of the... Why are you surprised they've got guns? Remember? They Israel, just used North, a rocket launcher to get you through the fence. Why aren't you asking, <laughs> where did you get a fucking rocket launcher? But no, the guns is what surprises you. Yeah. So now we cut over to him being initiated in what I think is the Roman Colosseum? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. It, well, well the, yeah, they built like a post-apocalypse version of that with their very expensive decor person. And they bought <laughs> like a couple hundred fire barrels yeah. and hired a metal worker to like cut them into flamey shapes to like accent the flames that were going to be in them. <laughs> and they line them up next to a fashion runway that is for rollerbladers. And they have like a big platform at the end of it where the initiate goes and they do and it's just like the warriors actually again there's a lot of warriors in this <laughs> yeah I, I wrote it's like a turning points usa conference up in here <laughs> oh, sorry it's a slightly less racist tur turning it's, points usa yeah. conference <laughs> it's it's like a moderate cpac yeah <laughs> and w the only thing i want to point out about this scene is that the chant of the roller boys is day of the rope day of the rope future is ours future is ours Roller boys rule, roller boys rule. But they cannot chant together. It no. is just watching no. 60 of these extras be like, day of the roller, roller rope, boy, damn rope, rope, okay. rope, okay. rope. No, We're all no, 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 stopping. No. We're all starting Stop. on all right. one. All right. Two. Rope, roller rope, boys rope, rush. Roller, oh, no, fucker. we're doing rope first and then roller boys. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, and they all clearly get tired, like the actors in the scene, <laughs> mm. because they have to hold their hands up with their fists clenched, like as if they're holding a rope between their fists in front of their face, I guess, is the gesture that they're going oh, for there. And okay. you can see all of them in this long scene being like, oh, can we just put our arms down between we when we're not saying actually day of the rope? It's just it's a, the lactic acid buildup. Do you know what I mean? It's a lot. 
And you've got Corey Hearn trying to do the chanting and he just can't do it. He's like a, a non-Catholic who's attended Catholic Mass. Just sort of mumbling <laughs> and joining in as, where he thinks he can. <laughs> <laughs> hey, yeah. He's just you guys getting have to the like bit a missile And book. thine is the king. To, oh, you guys don't do that bit. Okay, okay, sorry. <laughs> uh, there's gotta, you guys got to make your own missile book for all these chants. All right, it's fine. <laughs> So now it's now it's time for a sweet roller boys montage. And again, the movie is so sure this looks badass and it's so silly. There are no words in the English language for how silly this shot is. <laughs> With the sweepy arms again? The swishing oh, yep. arms way over the head. And I realized at this point, so like one of the, the keys to a good kind of sci-fi world is that you take the same world and you just uh, change a couple of the rules and then you let it all play out kind of as realistically as possible. And I realized that's what they've done here. And the only thing they've changed is that, that in their world, rollerblading's cool. And that's the only thing they've changed <laughs> and they try to let everything else kind of play out as is. Yep. It's, it is. It is cool. Yeah. Whatever. And we also cut over to them giving out food at their white supremacist rollerblade drug dealer gang's <laughs> food truck? Yeah, and giving out uh, Nazi propaganda comic books of themselves, yeah. I think. <laughs> yes, they have comic books of themselves. And let me just say, the thought of a bunch of like white guys who are interested in a weird activity that not a lot of people care about, making themselves into cartoon characters is really sad and depressing. I think we can all agree with that, can't we, Heath right? <laughs> okay. That's <laughs> what we call a long tail joke, everybody. There's, but if you there's people of color all throughout that company that you're referencing. <laughs> it's not. No, it doesn't count. Uh, Heath, was, <laughs> Heath was a cartoon in his old company. Anyways, um, uh, gotcha. <laughs> yeah, undercover lady shows up dressed like a cowboy and she needs to talk to him about the being an undercover cop A. <laughs> okay, literally, she's gone undercover as one of those normal drug addict uh, Annie Oakley's rollerbladers. <laughs> yeah, Patricia yep. Arquette, her character thinks being in fancy dress is the same thing as being undercover. It's like undercover, that's just like you're not wearing your cop uniform, right? So it's the same as fancy dress. It's exactly the same. <laughs> and then she tells him she's a cop by getting a badge out because all good under undercover cops carry their badges at all times. And I, I just really wanted her police badge to be like a sheriff's badge, and she just got really in on the theme. <laughs> She's really, really done the outfit well on the on the cowboy. Absolutely. But the point of her coming over dressed as a weird cowboy is she drags him to the side and says that he's got to get a job at the Mist House. So now it's time for Gary Lee to drive him to the Mist House while expositing her backstory, which is that her brother was a roller boy who died for the cause. And that, I was so confused by this. So, like, Gary Lee knows she had a brother, but doesn't know she's a cop? Because, like, you know <laughs> a fair bit about her life at this point, mate. You'd think you'd, you'd put those two things together. <laughs> yeah, it's it's very strange. I wanted him to be like, I don't know. Yeah, he joined the gang. He died. And then she, uh, I guess, became a costume-based prostitute. <laughs> it seems like uh, I haven't really looked into it. <laughs> and as they're driving, by the way, he's pointing out, this is so weird and inconsistent. They're driving through this Navy yard. He's like, oh, by the way, you know this gang of like six guys you've met? I own this Navy yard and two of the freighters inside it. And a yep. power plant. And a nuclear power plant. Yeah. I also, I bought that, you know, <laughs> diversify the portfolio. They've invested cool. a lot in infrastructure. I mean, fair play to them. I think it's their illegal gang that's also keeping all of the roads maintained. I think they're just the infrastructure <laughs> of this post-apocalyptic America is the 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 10 roller boys. <laughs> okay. yeah, it's so Marsh, you're saying there are pluses and minuses to a Nazi gang, you know, if they're doing good infrastructure <laughs> stuff. It's important to weigh. Some that. people like their rollerblades and we won't take it from them. <laughs> <laughs> so they go to check out the drugs, and this is where we see the drug RV. And I just want to say, for a movie that spends a tremendous amount of time and effort on a lot of its stuff, this super drug will literally be introduced by you mix some red with the yellow with some green, and now it's drugs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the RV, so they explain how the RV, he's saying like, uh, it's one man per shift, three shifts a day, seven days a week, 20 more at the end of the year. And I want to end with like solve for X, because it sounded like he was throwing <laughs> off a mask kind of puzzle. <laughs> But he says the only way to get in is the security system only accepts his handprint, which is which sounds like, oh, that's super secure. But you've just said it's three shifts a day, seven days a week. You're spending a lot of time putting your hand on this one sensor so many times a day. This is really inefficient. 
Maybe we could get a pin code or something. No, I'll just do my hand again. It's fine. <laughs> hey, Gary Lee, sorry. I know you're about to shoot a bazooka into like a Navy yard to do the initiation. You need to come back and open the the, the, the <laughs> van <laughs> again. We didn't time this well. It's, it's the beginning of the shift, though. I told you not to do initiations at the beginning of the shift. Like oh, said my that. God. Crazy billionaire reboot of this movie, which is pretty much just this movie, except we add Marsh and Andy at the beginning, <laughs> um, is... Is we just constantly interrupt the movie so that Gar like mid Gary Lee evil monologue was it one second sorry, uh, really right now is in the middle of the day that wrote all right guys be right back and then we just watch all the characters <laughs> pause for however long it takes for and them to drive stand there. still in rollerblades yeah <laughs> so that night he's at costume themed cop lady's house to report what he's learned uh, and she's going with a kimono theme tonight in case you're wondering so she does. She does keep it costume based at home as well. And and this is one of the weirdest scenes in the movie, right? This is supposed to be their like sex scene or kissing scene. It, it, what what's happening here? What I what I do know is happening is that the two cops who arrested who tried to like uh, tackle him in the sex carnival, they've bugged their colleague's house with audio and they sat outside her house listening to everything she does which is a very strange choice they don't really explain at all. And I thought, do the bad, are there bad guys? Are there bad guy cops? If so, who's paying them? And do they know she's a cop? What the fuck is going on? They just do not have any consistency. Shh, here. Don't ask questions. It's rollerblading. There's rollerblading, Marsh. <laughs> yeah. She literally pulls off his underwear and like the movie does the like camera pan away blowjob thing yeah. but then she just throws his underwear at him and she's like no blowjob for you now go narc on your drug ring <laughs> which yep. which means he must have been confused about whether he was getting a blowjob or not like midway through <laughs> he had blowjob face but what was she doing at that point that made him think he was it was very strange he's just winding <laughs> up the face winding it up <laughs> he's oh, just getting ready okay <laughs> and i just want to say i was so happy because this sex scene is very gross. There's a lot of mm. finger licking and like tongue on tongue licking. And my notes for this entire scene are just, I love that we did this to Marsh. I love the idea that Marsh would be watching this in his office and Nicola would walk in and he'd be like, no, it's for work, darling. I'm just, uh, you know, I've got that conference in South Africa next month. But it, before then, I'm going to watch I really Patricia like rollerblading. Arquette. Just to watch for a little bit. Suck Corey Haim's fingers. <laughs> if, I, if I heard Nicola coming uh, into, the, into the office, I would alt-tab into some actual porn to hide this <laughs> film from her. <laughs> nope, it's just uh, Granny's. It's just <laughs> Granny's <laughs> favorite, I swear. Yeah. So that, that scene ends. She, she gets his underwear and she's like, in your face, underwear. Same thing as before. Go be a cop now. Sorry for the like weirdly involved bit. That was, that was a lot. <laughs> And that's why you don't teach lessons. So <laughs> now that the very important power dynamic between undercover cops has been reestablished and changed a little bit, Griffin is ready to continue being an undercover cop and the plot can continue. But first, we're going to take one more quick break and then we'll be back for the roller-tastic conclusion of Prayer of the Roller Boys. Hi, I'm Heath Enright. And I'm Eli Bosnick. You know, here at God Awful Movies, we're always glad when we can be joined by our friend Michael Marshall of the Merseyside Skeptic Society, but it's with special pleasure. We're happy to bring Marsh on to tell you about our new sponsor, AdamandEve.com. Hi. Hey, Marsh. So, uh, Marsh, as Skeptic of the Year and one of the members of the Merseyside Skeptic Society, where would you recommend I go when I need the Booty Sparks Red Heart Gem Butt Plug at the best price. AdamandEve.com. Great. But Marsh, wait a second. As an international skeptic educator, why would you, Michael Marshall, international skeptic educator, recommend visiting AdamandEve.com here on this recorded podcast? Guys, this, this is not... Bop, 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 bop. <laughs> Script. Because you can get almost any one item for 50% off with code AWFUL. Wow. So just to be clear again, you, Michael Marshall, are recommending our listeners go buy the Booty Sparks Red Heart Gem Butt Plug for half off by using the code AWFUL at checkout at adamandeve.com. Yes, yes. I, that's what I'm doing. Yes. But that's not all, is it, Marsh? No. No, that's right. It's not all. 
Enter the code AWFUL at checkout. Select one item, and you'll also get 10 tantalizing free gifts. You'll get a sexy item for him, a special gift for her, and a third item you'll both enjoy. And six free spicy movies, plus free shipping. Won't they, Marsh? They'll get all that stuff, won't they, Marsh? Yes. Spicy movies. Now, Marsh, in your official capacity as expert representative to the NHS on homeopathy and as skeptic of the year, what are some of the top selling spicy movies on adamandeve.com? So Nina Hartley's Guide to Female Ejaculation. Mm -hmm, that's up there. Mm. Um, You're So Much Bigger Than My Husband, Volume 2. <laughs> Love that one. First one's good, too. And oh, guys, come on. I mean, I, I go to conferences. I like a do Marsh. official. Marsh. Proper... Marsh. And Granny's Guilty Pleasures. That's correct. Don't take it from us here at God Awful Movies. Take it from Michael Marshall, head of the Merseyside Skeptics and organizer of the world's largest skeptical conference. AdamandEve.com is the best place to buy Granny's Guilty Pleasures for 50% off. That's 50% off. Just about any item plus 10 free gifts. That's offer code AWFUL, A-W-F-U-L. Awful at checkout at adamandeve.com. I hate you both so much. I love you. Love Granny, though. I spent the day consulting the BBC on science, and <laughs> now, now I'm here. <laughs> now you did this. You wanted to see me, Chief? Yeah, Detective Casey, come on in. Wanted to talk to you about the Roller Boy case. What about it, Chief? So, um, yeah, I don't want you to take this the wrong way, but, uh, there's been some department questions about your methods. Well, I play by my own rules. How so, Chief? Yeah, uh, so last month, and I'm quoting you from your report here, it says, I fucked a bunch of roller boys like a bunch. Sure did, Chief. Sure did. Right. So, did you gain any intel there? Any, any success turning any of them state's evidence? Mm, no. Why? Did, okay. D did you maybe convince them to bring you mist so, so we could bust and flip them? Nope. Nope. Just, uh, just fucked them. Fucked them. Uh, got it. But uh, that's it. I've got a new plan, Chief, and this oh, one. Right is sure to bring the whole thing toppling down. Okay, uh, what's that? So this week, the Roller Boys are getting together for a big meeting. I mean, all of them, in one place. So what I'm thinking is, I dress like a sexy pirate, right? Uh, and then it, uh, gonna stop you right there. Does this plan end with you fucking some, if not all, of the Roller Boys? Yes. Got it. But dressed as a pirate. <laughs> And we're back. When we left off, Griffin was on his way back to his house van after getting sex pranked by a fellow police officer. <laughs> now he's going to talk to Milty. <laughs> and yep. he, he comes in and he's like, I had sex with a woman. <laughs> Milty's like, what? Did, did you though? And he's like, no. no. I pranked. Yeah. And man, this kid's performance is terrible. I just wrote in my notes, there were speak and says at this point in history. Like, they could have just hired a speak and say instead of this kid. It would have been just as good. <laughs> oh, he's so obnoxious. And you, you're meant to care about him and you just really don't. You know, you want him to just go have a missed overdose and fuck off and die so we can just get, <laughs> get him out of the way. Oh, that would be great. That would be great. But instead, no, we're going to watch the Roller Boys do a... A roll by shooting. The joke <laughs> oh, that I made is, earlier in the episode will come to is, fruition. They will literally yes, do wonderful. a roll by shooting of the B-13s. Right. Which does this, why? Like what, <laughs> what's happening? <laughs> they're planning their thing and they're like, all right, so what do we do now? You want to start like a big gunfight or something? <laughs> and somebody must have been like, well, I, I, I get where you're going, but maybe we just keep going with the... Uh, the big multinational corporation thing that we're doing? <laughs> no, gunfight. And they do, and we get more arm swishy thing. And the, <laughs> they very clearly- Oh, in the slow motion. Very clearly we're the like- slow motion as they come up. Yeah, in slow-mo. Very clearly they were in like two lines, double file. 
And then at some point, Gary Lee had to be like, guys, guys, uh, D up, D up. We're doing the two lines. <laughs> but then fan out when I do the signal flying V like Mighty Ducks. I didn't do the signal yet. Okay, everybody go back, go back. We're going to look like it. We need to look cool when we show up for this. Right. And then they slow-mo, like, jump over the pile of tires that surrounds the B-13's big party, and they start firing guns everywhere. Yeah. And this is where the, the point of this scene is that Griffin's supposed to shoot two children that are running away, and he doesn't, and Bullwinkle catches him because he knows he's not a real roller boy. <laughs> it's, it's the silliest word. You can't say, like, you're not a real roller boy. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 like, it's a real it's problem. So dumb. So now we cut back over to the Nazis where little Milty is in trouble for failing his drug test. Yep. <laughs> He's doing the mist and Gary Lee walks up and gives oh. him a weird big slap in the face. <laughs> it's a real, it's a really convincing slap for everything that happens in the film. This slap is the most convincing thing anybody does in the film. It feels like he actually <laughs> hit this kid and I was there for it. I was sympathizing with Gary Lee of the Roller Boys at this point. It was, I watched it three times. It was cathartic. But Gary Lee's on rollerblades and he, he does the big slap and it throws him off balance a little bit. He has to catch his balance again. It's the best. Uh, but also it's like you broke a rule about using mist so you get a slap and I thought I, I felt like it would be harsher I felt like the enforcement of that rule would be way harsher than a slap <laughs> yeah. well that's it and then we go back to uh, Speedbagger at his uh, booming wheel repair business some more yep. still and, and he's like are you still mad at me for joining the white supremacist gang you're still mad at me for joining the white supremacist gang <laughs> Got you an edible arrangement this time. <laughs> <laughs> but the important thing about this scene is that Bullwinkle was spying on him and he knows that he is friends with Speedbagger. But like, I don't understand why that's a big problem because they know for a fact that he used to live there with Speedbagger. So the big problem here is that he joined the Roller Boys and then went back to a place where he lived for ages to talk to a guy he lived with. I don't understand why this is such a suspicious thing for Bullwinkle to be like, ha ha, I've caught him out from the cover of this conveniently placed fresh fruit vendor that's on the street. <laughs> yeah. And, <laughs> right. It means nothing, but we still get the greatest menacing apple bite here <laughs> from Bullwinkle. He's, it's so silly. He, he's, he's doing the spy thing and then he takes the bite of the apple and he's like, Mwah, <laughs> too, much, too much apple, too much apple for a mwah. Okay. Yeah. So now we cut over to Griffin getting his roller boy like midterm review from Gary Lee. <laughs> right? He's like, look, I really need you to give this 100% if you want a sticker that says I'm great not a job. <laughs> Did you say I'm not a cop really loud before I finished? I'm not though. And he's like, cool, um, me neither, me neither. But he's saying, like, your heart's not in being a white supremacist. Like, don't, don't be a half-hearted white supremacist. Come on, really give it, give it. You really probably hate people who aren't white. Don't just, like, go, eh, I'm not that keen. Really go for it. <laughs> cool. Uh, why, don't, why don't you set up, like, some sort of test for me to do that? Like, <laughs> uh, maybe a homeless guy punching circle with rollerblades? Homeless guy punching circle. <laughs> yep, so that's what happens. Yep. <laughs> they, they're, they're at uh, another one of their highly produced areas, like just, just for this. Like they built a homeless guy punching circle rollerblading area. <laughs> mm -hmm. And they're all spinning around, circling this one guy. And I wanted them so badly to get dizzy and fall. <laughs> <laughs> they're just all on the ground. But the big reveal of this scene, of course, is that... <gasps> The homeless guy they were punching was Speedbagger the whole time. And like, let's just deal with the realism of this moment for a second, right? Like, we're supposed to believe that he was skating around someone he lived with in a circle, but because he couldn't see exactly his face, he was totally unaware of who it might be. Yeah, yeah. <sighs> but like, he had, a, I think he had a bag over his face, but... It was still the only black person we've met in the entire film. So the, the odds of it being Speedbagger were pretty high at this point. And you'd think Speedbagger <laughs> would have been like, oh, uh, ow, that hurts. But like sort of while rhyming in a sort of free association <laughs> way. I'm Speedbagger. Just say his name once. It would have been helpful. Yeah, exactly. Now. So now we cut over to Speedbagger's post-apocalyptic hospital room. So... 
It's run by gangs filled with slums, but a guy who runs a wheel repair shop has a full hospital suite to himself when he's attacked. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And they basically have an argument back and forth about whether or not they're going to run away from the gang or if they're going to stick it out and try and bust them. Yeah, and she's going to stick around because her brother was a really nice white supremacist before the whole gang thing <laughs> happened. So she needs to honor his memory. Yeah, and she has this moment where she's like, you think I like hanging out with those roller boys all the time, huh? And like, I don't want to be this guy, but I feel like all the sex as part of her job was her idea. Like, we never see anyone being like, you dress like a fucking window washer and go blow a bunch of people. <laughs> a window washer would have been a good one. Yep, yeah. exactly. I like that. But yeah, in the middle of that argument, they, they start to make out and have sex, right? Maybe? Well, I'm not I'll sure. Say. I mean, I'd like to think they don't. I reckon she just plays another elaborate prank on him. And there's just going to be a, cons a constant series of one upmanships about how far they can get each other. I w yes, that, I wanted that to keep going as, throughout <laughs> the movie. Absolutely. Yeah, it's called Mormonism. Uh, so yeah, it's the next morning and, and either they did sex pranks or they did sex because he's naked and Bullwinkle has showed up at this undercover cop's house to accuse him of not having his heart in the gang again. And also to shout the N-word in a very disturbing and surprising and upsetting <laughs> way. I mean, fucking hell, that was, a, that was a surprise to me. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Very, very upsetting. Also, Corey Haim has the single shoulder suspender with the other one down. Yep. With this one strap up. And it's, it, this is like the perfect 1990 thing. He was just rocking that style at home. He was just like <laughs> at home and he was like, yeah, I'm going to put up one. I'm going to yep. snap up one. And this is also where he discovers that he's an undercover cop because she left her comically large police badge out on the kitchen table. <laughs> oh. And he doesn't see it. No, no, no. He doesn't see it. He puts his hand on the badge as he goes to stand up. Like Bullwinkle's so sitting there chatting and he puts his hand and he's like, wait a second. What's my hand on? That feels like a police badge. Let me look. It is a police badge. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? What I really wanted was for him to sort of like push himself up off the table with his hand on the police badge, but so hard that it hurt. And so instead he like lifts his hand up to look at it. And there's the imprint of a police badge on his hand. And that's how he figures it out. <laughs> is this a backwards police badge? Oh, it's a real one. <laughs> what, what's an e What's an essay poll? Or essay lop? Essay lop? What's an essay lop? <laughs> So yeah, he puts them, he gets out his gun and he, he's, he's going to monologue at them, but it's fucking amazing. He's like, now that I'm about to kill you, I want you to know that you're one of the, bam. <laughs> you're right, yeah. This is where the, uh, the, the two cops that caught him at the carnival show up and one of them sneaks up behind Bullwinkle and shoots him in the head. Shoots him in the back of the head, like yeah. instantly. And I just, I wrote in my notes, that's not what happens when you shoot someone in the back of the head. It is an incredible death scene. He sort of flails around quite a lot. In, in, it's, it's very strange. It's very strange. Eli, question, uh, what happens when you shoot somebody in the back of the head at point blank range? I mean, I've heard, your experience? they definitely don't just flail around and fall. They're definitely not this scene, <laughs> but you'd think there'd be some like facial damage, right? As opposed to just like, like the bullet going into the back of his head and then setting up there with some roommates. <laughs> <laughs> so it's the next day, the day of his big first drug shift and the day when he's going to let all the cops into the drug RV to get to the drugs, which will bring down the roller boys. <laughs> and this is where we learn that Gary Lee has brought him a drug cooking partner. Bango. Yep. I wrote my notes. You're going to be shadowing him, but you will not be splitting his tips. Just so you know. <laughs> he also brings uh, some just super obvious Dunkin' Donuts product placement here. It. Oh, it's, it's, it's post apocalyptic amazing. hobo drug land, but Dunkin' Donuts still exists. I, I, I like to think it's, it's Bango was so excited about teaching Griffin that he's like, oh, it's my first day. I get to teach him. I'll bring donuts. I'll be a really good teacher. I think he was just really, <laughs> really into this training day. <laughs> I really wanted the directions to that Dunkin' Donuts. Just like, oh, there's a Dunkin' around here? Oh, yeah, no. Uh, so you know the sex carnival, right? You go about a half mile past that, but <laughs> yeah. if you've hit the giant closed-in, fenced-in, armed 
guarded homeless shelters, you've gone too far. It's right there. There are several of those. The, <laughs> the first one? Yeah, the first one right there. Okay. Can we talk about this contraption that they <laughs> use to make the drugs one more time? So uh, we said earlier, yeah, there's three buckets, very small buckets of like colored sand from yep. Michael's craft store. <laughs> and then it goes through a, a couple of <laughs> 1990 computery devices. Yep. And then it is fruit by the foot. <laughs> yep, the then it is fruit by the foot. Yeah. And Bango's having such a lovely time explaining every little bit of it. He's really, really proud of the work of the setup. It's He's a really good teacher. Honestly, the only thing I enjoy about this entire film was Bangor's performance. I, I had a way of <laughs> time excellent. watching all of this scene. Yeah. He also, very important, he explains the um, the hydrochloric acid, like, in case the cops show up thing that just, like, flushes out the whole system so they don't get in trouble. Yep. And he says 18 molar hydrochloric acid, which, no, no, no it's not. It's not. It's... It's not. I, I, I believe 12 is like the theoretically highest possible amount for liquid hydrochloric acid. It's fine. Also, it's fine. I love the idea that like you pull a lever and hydrochloric acid dissolves all the drugs and then the cops show up and you're like, nothing illegal about sitting in a van. <laughs> <laughs> with, with all of these machineries and very clear drug making capabilities. And buckets of precursors for fruit by the foot, the drug that we all know exists. <laughs> I don't want to live in a country where it's not legal for two guys to sit alone in a van full of drug-making equipment <laughs> filled with acid. I that is only accessible through a palm print scanner every eight <laughs> hours. <laughs> so yeah, we watch a little like, I, I guess I got to call it like hanging out in a drug van montage, right? Where they're like yep. doing push-ups and playing 20 questions. <laughs> Yep. Melting rats in the uh, in the acid. Mm -hmm. Melting rats in the acid. And then finally Griffin is like, oh, hey, this is new. Um, what's this? Th this this bag with a giant skull and crossbones on it? Is it uh, like uh, protein powder? You just make it in shakes <laughs> or whatever. And Bangle's like, ah, that is actually not protein powder. Uh, it's actually MacGuffin powder. That is <laughs> the rope of the day of the rope. Yeah. And, and we learn... That the day of the rope is making everyone who uses mist sterile. Yep. yep. It's a eugenics plot for <laughs> drug users. Well, you know, th theoretically, eugenics, there's nothing to say eugenics couldn't work. I mean, that's the, uh, uh, that's, that's the main objection we all have to eugenics, I think. Marsh, you're doing a lot of pushing possible. back against the arguments against the Nazi gang <laughs> with the eugenics. <laughs> Can I just give you that note? <laughs> I get it. Marsh's Twitter has just been too... <laughs> I know who Marsh has been following on Twitter. So guess what I'm saying. <laughs> oh, so yeah. Finally, after him being like, yeah, no, this is just... We were giving everyone the birth control pill and their drugs. It's our evil plan. The cops show up and Corey slash Griffin hits him with a pipe in the head. Yeah. And man, does this movie not know when ha what happens when you get hit in the head with a pipe. <laughs> no. Well, I mean, if Corey Haim hits you with a pipe, I feel like it yeah, doesn't matter. Yeah, that's possible. Mm -hmm. I, got, I got to be honest. And also, being honest, I'm rooting for Bangle here in this fight the whole time. I just, <laughs> I really don't like Corey Haim's face. Mm -hmm. I just don't like him. Yeah, I mean, Bangle's been lovely this entire movie. He brought donuts for a new employee. He's, He's trying delightful. to get him. Yeah. He's got a sweet, you know, fruit by the foot drug mix that he puts on. They got some good music going. Yeah, I'm rooting for him here. But the cops show up and they uh, they catch Bangle just in time. Yeah. Although Bangle does hit the switch to destruct. So they do try to sort of dump everything by that uh, that big button, that big switch labeled destruct, which was presumably it's... not set to destruct previously. It was set to something else. Exactly. It was, it was set to not destruct. It's a, they have a switch that, that needs to be flipped and they're like, it feels like a button situation. You know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> So just as they're walking everyone outside, the day is saved. Who's waiting for them? But Gary Lee with Ponytail as his hostage. <laughs> and we get one more amazing little rollerblade moment here. Well, we're going to get another, another amazing rollerblade moment in a second. But they're walking out of the little van and <laughs> Griffin's the only one on rollerblades. So he's just like sadly 
rolling, but all the cops are on foot and it's the <laughs> fucking funniest thing. And then all the roller boys show up. And again, I remembered that they were all on rollerblades and I laughed out loud again because they slowly just sort of like roll intimidatingly into shots. It's incredible. <laughs> And again, this this scene is so weird because he's like, give me the drugs, Griffin. And all the cops are like, no, we're not no. going to do that. Oh, <laughs> no. I'll shoot him. Okay. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and this is all just like a big delay. They're about to have a gunfight and they all like agree like, all right, well, just let the, let the main guy do a speechy thing and argue with Griffin for a second. Yep. Okay, gunfight. Yeah. Uh, and the gunfight is, is just incredible because... It, it's you can tell that the roller boys are all at this point thinking shit. It's it's really hard to dodge bullets when you can like mostly just go in a straight line when that's mostly what you've got you know, on the rollerblades is just straight line with a little bit of a turn. Very slalom, hard to dodge slalom, a bullet. Slalom, Marsh. Think about it. <laughs> <laughs> so now it's time for the big finale, and that means Griffin is going to run away from Gary Lee in a big old skate chase. <laughs> Why is he running away from him? And look. I know a lot of people don't watch along with us, but there really are no proper words to describe this rollerblade-based gun chase. Oh, wait, but <laughs> yeah, there's no stakes to this chase. It makes no. no sense. But the greatest physical comedy of all time happens here because they decide to start a rollerblade chase and then have it go up a long flight of stairs. <laughs> and they yeah, both, they do a chase in the silly rollerblade climb. It's literally, <laughs> clomp, clomp, ow, ow, it's my ankle. So long. It's, it's just so clomping long. the way up. It's amazing. <laughs> it's, and, and again, why go upstairs there? There's, there's no <laughs> reason. There. They don't need to be up for any reason. They're just like going to keep a, a chase going into their warehousey areas. It's so silly. Yeah. The best. Uh, and by the way, this chase truly pushes the limit of like what even the people who made this movie think is cool about rollerblading. Like there's so many unnecessary, very small pipes that get jumped over. It's a bummer. Yeah, yeah. They might as well stop at the bottom of the stairs and each take off their rollerblades very slowly and awkwardly and be like, ah, oh, the knot is, I doubled it. I doubled it. <sighs> no, they, right. they go through all the stunts. You know, they jump up a few little stairs. They jump down some little stairs. They do a spin. They hit all of the high notes of rollerblade chasing. Yeah. <laughs> and I should point out that the way he finally, like, defeats Gary Lee, who has been chasing him and shooting at him with almost infinite bullets, is to rollerblade up to a pole, spin around it, barely, <laughs> and kick him in the chest. Yeah. It's the greatest thing. Why is that pole there, first of all? <laughs> <laughs> They're in their, like, warehousey drug dealer area, the Navy shipyard, but they have, like, a like a pole dancing class for employees in this one spot in the <laughs> warehouse. Yep. It's cool. Very, very sad. So Gary Lee is being led away by the cops, still on rollerblades. It's so stupid. He's still on roller skates. The cop's walking. He's just like sadly rolling. Oh, he's, God. He's rolling and trying to be menacing at the same time. He's like, you should have killed me, Griffin. You should have... Uh, 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 not too fast. Huh? Not too oh. fast. Oh. <laughs> and then we cut to Speedbagger, Milty, sex costume-based cop lady, and Griffin running away from the roller boys to Oregon. Yeah. Yeah, Speedbagger has recovered from his life-threatening conditions really quickly because it must only be a couple of days since he was in the hospital, but he's absolutely fine. Milty is being Milty, so he's being obnoxious and annoying as fuck, and they're off to start a brand new life in Oregon. Obviously Oregon. <laughs> yeah. He's going to open up a big wheel shop in Portland. <laughs> yeah, I guess. And hey, it's, it's a good city for it. And then this movie, in possibly its most baffling scene, is going to... He's super hard for a sequel. We see <laughs> Gary Lee spray painting his cell and planning his revenge because he wants to expand his territory, chin stroke, chin stroke, <laughs> out to Oregon. And it, yep. he's got his accountant slash lawyer in the prison cell with him. And he says, you know, you know, I've been thinking and I want him to finish that sentence by saying, I've been thinking. The rollerblades was a really fucking stupid idea. Why did nobody stop me? This is, don't surround yourself with yes boys. 
<laughs> I'm not even good at it. I keep falling off balance a little bit in the middle of speeches and I'm trying to be serious. <laughs> and he's explaining this to, again, yes, a CPA slash lawyer who has a desk, like a yes. fancy desk yeah, in his inside his jail cell. cell. Yeah. <laughs> and he's, and Gary Lee's like getting, getting distracted and walking over to the walls and like spray painting during his evil speech. <laughs> so good. CPA is like, Hey, just, you know, don't, you're getting distracted. Good. Just tell me, tell me the plan. That's the important thing. <laughs> Shut up, Dave. I'm doing, doing a dragon, eating a cross on the side of the thing. <laughs> but yeah, we're getting a sequel. They are certain of it. Oh and, yeah. Uh, so this was 1990. Um, been 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> I'm guessing they're not doing that. We need to buy the rights to this. Corey Haim is dead, so that's not a great sign for his continuation as the character. <laughs> yeah, so they close it on the hard sequel suggestion. We'll, we'll find out. Final question before we wrap it all up. Rollerblading is awesome. <laughs> no. Okay, sorry. That, oh, sorry. That's <laughs> a question. <laughs> I, uh, 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 question. What's the name of the sequel and what happens? Uh, okay, it's a comedy, a lighter tack on this universe. It's called Droll Bounce. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, excellent. I, I think uh, in the sequel, Gary Lee breaks out of prison, finds Griffin, who's now running a skate park in Portland, and challenges mm. him to like a stunt skate off uh, if whoever gets control of the skate park. And it's Prayer of the Roller Boys <laughs> 2, The Oregon Rail. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> All right. Well, while that does it for our review of Prayer of the Roller Boys, it's not going to do it for the episode just yet because we still need to get you excited for some sodomy. Stay with me. Eli's <laughs> going to explain. Eli, what's on deck? Sodom and Gomorrah, the 1962 scare film about what Sodom and Gomorrah was like. Fantastic. Get ready. So with that to look forward to, we'll bring episode 240 to a merciful close. Huge thanks to Marsh as always. And for anybody who's new, where can they find some more Marsh stuff? Uh, so you can check out my podcast, Skeptics with a K, uh, on iTunes and everywhere else. Uh, or if you look up Good Thinking Society, uh, that's my sort of mature day job side of things uh, where I, uh, I don't talk about these types of things, but I try and do some, uh, some skeptical work. So yeah, check us out there. Cool. And uh, again, what is your favorite object at adamandeve.com? <laughs> it's really hard to choose. It's such a fantastic range. Okay. Everything. Great answer. <laughs> and once again, a huge thanks to our Patreon donors for all the generosity. If you'd like to help support the show, you can make a per episode donation at patreon.com slash godawful. And that'll get you early access to an ad-free version of every episode. You can also help us out by leaving us good reviews in review spots and by sharing the show on all your various social media platforms. And if you enjoyed this show, be sure to check out our sibling shows, The Scathing Atheist, Citation Needed, The Skeptocrat, and D&D Minus, available in all those podcasty places. If you have questions, comments, or cinematic suggestions, you can email godawfulmovies at gmail.com. Legal services for this podcast are provided by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres. Our theme song is written and performed by Ryan Slotnick of Evil Giraffes on Mars. All of the music was written and performed by our audio engineer, Morgan Clark, and was used with permission. Thanks again for giving us a chunk of your life this week. For Michael Marshall and Eli Bosnick, I'm Heath Enright, promising to work hard to earn another chunk next week. Until then, we'll leave you with the Animal House clothes. Griffin went on to face his greatest nemesis of all, Gravel. <laughs> <laughs> Joe Arpaio, Dinesh D'Souza, and Gary Lee all got pardoned by Donald Trump. <laughs> Corey went on to face his greatest nemesis, Oxycontin. <laughs> <laughs> also, I'm pretty sure, I know it's a silly movie, but I'm pretty sure yesterday, the 12th of March, was the day of the rope. I'm like, <laughs> I think that's what happened. Pretty sure. Yeah, I think day of the rope does. And I'll do the 10 count here. Five. Five count. That's right. <laughs> Doing it double. Wow. Doing it double. If, if you do it this time, do 10 this time. You won't need to do one next time. That's how it works. Just store them. That's right. Yeah, you can just break them what up. What you need exactly. to do is stockpile <laughs> your counting uh, and get them all, all out right now. That's the like only... toilet paper. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs>
I mean, Eli, I assume you're always stock, stockpiling toilet paper, but that's for a, a genuine. Well, that's need. the thing is I've I've been ready this whole time. <laughs> I will be your toilet paper king when the time comes. <laughs> Eli's the Baron Harkonnen of toilet yeah, paper. Exactly. Right <laughs> Complete with bubble shield. <laughs> you don't use the family cloth. Do not use the family cloth. <laughs> Thank right. God. Go green, you bigot. If, if this is all references, it's all lost on me over here. <laughs> the family cloth is literally kind of what it sounds like. It's just like, we keep using a cloth over and over and wash it. Wow. We, 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 we just no, I mean, I, I worked out what a cloth would be reusable. used for, but I, I, I didn't work out who. It's who like a tea that. towel. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I have the... The square ones, I, I really skate. <laughs> it's a, in one line on nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Get the dimensions. fuck out. <laughs> Murder him. <laughs> Can it be in belt form? <laughs> How else would you get it? Yeah, good, stupid question, right? Where, where does money go other than ammo belts? Yeah, ammo belts. Great. Yeah, that down. Did you write it day of the rope? Oh, absolutely. Cool. That's important. Don't tell anybody. No, I like how this sketch had a clean ending, but now it just sort of <laughs> died like an old person of Let's coronavirus. Have it fizzle <laughs> slower. Here. There we go. Wait, wait, <laughs> keep it going. Just because Morgan was getting comfortable, he had dragged his little marquee tool over. And if we just keep going, it's going to have to do that thing mm -hmm. where it scrolls too far. Oh, he dragged it down. So now... Oh, you know what? Can we switch from the decoration to the print? Yes. Let's do it all over Great. again. <laughs> <laughs> I sure hope someone doesn't like put this online and put a bunch of SEO tagging on it. That would be terrible. <laughs> Unlike a website. It's not already an existing <laughs> website, I sure hope. True story. I had to take all the SEO tagging off of skepticoftheyear.com because it was on like your third Google page. And I had a horrifying <laughs> moment where I realized like, oh God, this too could, far, too far. This was funny for the day. <laughs> so this, this may be genuinely uh, affecting his career at this point. Yeah. <laughs> Someone's like, all right, let's, let's click next. Okay. A hot load of skeptic all over your face and chest. <laughs> <laughs> the preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2020. All rights reserved.